every month, I am a police chaplain, volunteer police chaplain. I got into that some years ago, and I do it not because it's so cool and not because it's so fun. Have you ever noticed no one calls the police to tell them everything's great? Hello, 911. I, I just called to tell you that everything's fine. How are you? That's not how it works. And most often in police chaplaincy, we are called to accompany officers to deliver what's called death notifications. You do that in a group of two or more because people who receive that horrible news sometimes react violently to and endanger the people around them or endanger themselves. So you do that in twos if you're wise, at least two. And if you ever have a policeman or a chaplain show up on your front porch, they are there to tell you something that you don't want to hear. And they are there also to tell you something you need to hear. They don't want to say it. You don't want to hear it. But it needs very much to be said. As I've been reading through the book of Mark, this series that we are doing right now, I notice that many of the words of Jesus are kind of like those words. If Jesus had been traveling around trying to raise up a fan club, if he had been trying to start some kind of a political moment, he wouldn't have said a lot of the things that he said. But Jesus was in, remember that? Jesus was in he was completely given over to the Father's purposes for his life on earth. And so Jesus said things that needed to be said. His words created a variety of reactions. Most of the words of Jesus, I noticed this going through Mark, and if you've got a red-letter Bible that shows all the, let, all the words of Jesus in red, most of the words of Jesus that are in the book of Mark are those difficult words. The ones that are hard to listen. The ones that are hard to deliver because they're hard to listen to. And I think from that, we have got an example, one example of what it means to be in. To be totally given over to God's purposes in your life. Part of what happens when you're in for the Lord is that you say things that need to be said, even though they're not easy to say. Some of what Jesus said was to help sort through who was in and who wasn't in. And with just a few words, Jesus could sift a crowd. He'd say something, and the people who didn't want to hear it, who weren't sincere, would go packing. The people who wanted to hear the truth would stay and listen. Some of the words that Jesus gave were simply to teach about the kingdom. We took a look at his parables a little bit, and, and we saw some of that. They were just instructive. And then some of Jesus' words, the ones we're going to really look at today, were about shaping the hearts of the people who listened. How do we speak to our culture as God's people? How do we speak to one another? That's what I'd like to look at today. I'm convinced there are answers to be found in the words of Jesus, and I think this is the answer, that following Jesus' example includes that we care enough to say what's needed. So if I offend you this morning, or if you find it hard to listen to, I'm just trying to say what's needed. I'll go on. Jesus said what needed to be said, and that should shape how we speak to our culture. Amen? If you are in, like Jesus was in, then we care enough to say what's needed to our culture, to say what our culture needs to hear. Yes, this culture that seems to thrive on reacting to how you said the wrong thing. You triggered me. That was a microaggression. You're insensitive. You need to be canceled. Add to that that you're a follower of Jesus and the odds of you saying the wrong thing go way up. And so what happens is, I've observed this, the people who actually care about other people have been scared into silence. Haven't we? 
I remember a year ago, or years ago, at Southeast Christian Church, Louisville, Kentucky, they had as their mission statement this statement, we exist to evangelize the lost, edify the saved, minister to the needy, and be a conscience in the community. I always liked that conviction. I always thought that was well stated. It was about the whole church, by the way. It wasn't just its leaders. That's what Southeast Christian Church set out to be. That last line really caught me. The conscience of the community. And it makes me wonder if God's people living in Rockford, Illinois, don't provide some kind of moral compass, some kind of moral direction, some visible presence in our community of the fruit of the Spirit, some source of truth, some source of wisdom for our community, who will? Who will set the moral direction? Who will be a source of truth and wisdom for the people of our community? And you know what? Just with those words the community will likely be offended. Who are you? Who are you to tell us what to do? Who are you to ride in on your high horse and act like you're something? (laughs) Well, we're just people who are trying to be salt and light in the world. We have been commanded by our Lord to do that. And either we can obey him or we can bow to your demands. We can't do both, church. We have to say what our culture needs to hear. Can I get some agreement on that? Are we being salt that has an effect on the flavor of our world? Are we being light that illuminates things that otherwise won't be seen? That is why we speak to our culture. It needs us. Even though the culture may not appreciate it and may try to silence us, Jesus was surrounded by people who not only wanted to shut him up, but to kill him. But he didn't remain silent. That's why we speak. But how? How do we speak to our culture? I'm glad you asked that. Let me suggest From the examples of Jesus, here are some answers to that. First of all, we understand where they are. John chapter 2, verse 24, it says that Jesus knew all people. It says he knew what was in man. Jesus knew what was inside of people. He loved them anyway. But he knew what they needed to hear. And so to follow his example on this, we, you and I, need to have some understanding of where people are. And it's one place where we can't follow Jesus' example completely. I'm actually thankful for that. I'm glad I don't know what's on everybody's heart completely. But we do, if we're going to follow his example, we do need to know enough about people to study our culture so that we can speak to them with some awareness and some wisdom of what people need to hear. We need to understand where they are. We also need to speak the truth regardless of popularity. Have you noticed that Jesus said some things that upset people? It didn't keep him from saying the truth, but Mark chapter 8, verse 38, these are the kinds of things he said. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Mark 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Chapter 16, verse 16, Jesus says this, Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, those ideas are things that stirred up some controversy in Jesus' day. They are words that in many places of our own culture won't go over really well. So do we keep it to ourselves? Not if we're in like Jesus was in. I like this quote I ran across from Adrian Rogers. Adrian Rogers was pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Tennessee. And he reminded his church family in a message, it is better to be divided by truth 
than to be united in error. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. Let me tell you something, friend. It is not love and it is not friendship if we fail to declare the whole counsel of God. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. It is better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with the multitude. It is better to ultimately succeed with the truth than to temporarily succeed with a lie. I don't know what year he said those words, but they're really relevant. We also need to speak to our culture by speaking with biblical authority. Remember Central Christian Church's core values? We've got five that we periodically get in front of us and remind one another, here are our core values. Number one on that list, biblical truth. Biblical truth. After throwing the money changers and the animal salespeople out of the temple and creating quite a stir, before the dust had settled, Jesus turned to the words of Isaiah 56 and applied them to the situation. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And Jesus was quick to give scripture for the reason for what he said and what he did. He didn't say, now I feel really strongly about this. He didn't say, a recent recent Gallup poll says. He didn't say, I can yell louder than you can. He didn't say, I'll organize and I will cancel you. He said, here's what God's word says. So when someone starts sounding off about abortion or the definition of marriage or human sexuality or about the role of government, about parental authority, about environmentalism, God's people respond by relating God's authority on those subjects. Amen? That's how we speak to our culture. In five minutes, that's how you do it. There's a lot more to be said there. Come back in September. We'll be looking at those kinds of things in a lot more detail. I've planned that. But for now, let's just acknowledge Jesus spoke to the culture he was in. His people should do the same. The thing I would really like to look at this morning is that he said what needed to be said, and that will shape how we speak to each other. If we're in like Jesus was in, then we care enough to say, what needs to be said to each other. January 16th of this year, Tom, Scott, Jim, Brian, Brian, and me all sat down for something we've never done before. We had, ahead of time, answered a bunch of questions about ourselves, several sheets of it, and given copies to everyone in that group. And that night, we sat down for what is called a peer review. So picture this, okay? We're all sitting in the conference room. We have passed out to one another deep thoughts about ourselves. And the agenda for the night was we're going to go around the table, and for every man there, we're going to tell them one thing that they do that really contributes to the team. And then... We're going to tell them one thing that they do that we really wish they'd change about themselves. Yeah. Okay. So we sat down to do that. We laid out a couple of ground rules, and away we went, just to get a feel for how that goes. This morning, I want you to turn to the person next to you here and tell them something that they do that is just really great, and then I want you to tell them something that you really can't stand about them, okay? Okay. I'm kidding. (laughs) We're not going to try that. How awkward, right? How awkward. But you know what? We did that. We did that. A group of guys saying, you know, I really like this about you. This is something about you that's really good. And then following it up with, here's something about you that I really wish you would change. Now, why would we do that? Here's why. 
because we care about each other and because we care about being good leaders. I compared it to having a colonoscopy. <laughs> Why would you do that test? Well, it's not comfortable, but it's needed. So we had that meeting, something we'd never done before. We laid out a couple ground rules. We did it, and when it was all said and done, we agreed. We agreed to this. When it was all said and done, it was good for us. It was a good thing. It helped us speak to one another on a necessary level. And I am telling you this morning in detail that your leadership did this because maybe, just maybe, it will encourage our church family to be more deliberate to act just like that. Jesus said some things to those who were closest to him that needed to be said. Sometimes they were difficult to say, and sometimes they were difficult to hear. Mark, what are some of those things? Well, here's one story in chapter 8. You're going on a boat trip. Going to be out on the water for some hours. Who's in charge of snacks? <laughs> Apparently nobody. Verse 14, now they'd forgotten to bring bread. They had only one loaf with them in the boat. You ever wonder who had that loaf? Probably Judas, you know. <laughs> and Jesus does this. He cautioned them, saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not un yet understand? Roughly paraphrased, you guys still haven't put this together, have you? Or to say it without words, Could it be, <clears throat> sometimes we don't perceive or understand, could it be, do we have hearts that are hardened? Do we look and listen but not see and hear? Do we forget what we say we've already accepted? That's what Jesus was asking. Very same chapter, just a little bit later, Jesus has just told the 12, for the very first time, he has told them very clearly that in Jerusalem he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be put to death, and he's going to rise again on the third day. How do they handle that news? Verse 32, chapter 8. He said this plainly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But Peter, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Needed to be said. Perhaps we just don't understand the Lord's agenda. Is it possible, even in a position of thinking that the Lord uh, has it wrong, we would say such things? If it's true, shouldn't someone say something? Yes. And those are just a couple of examples. There are a lot more times where you can just hear Jesus sigh as he answers, <sighs> and says what needs to be said to his closest friends. They all remind me that we need to care enough about each other in the Lord's family to say some of the things that need to be said. Why should we say it? Why should we say what needs to be said? Because following Jesus' example includes we care enough to say what's needed. That's the very first hurdle, I think, to get over, and I've been really encouraged. I'll tell you this, I've been really encouraged by a lot of the conversations I've been hearing in the hallways of Central Christian Church in recent weeks. As I hear people speaking about 
something that they have learned or something that challenged them in the everyday evangelism class. People are talking about that, saying things that need to be said. I want to give us some homework today. I want to give three guidelines of how we're supposed to speak to one another. I'm sure that's what's on your mind now. How do we do this? All right. Number one, speak truth to each other. Speak truth to each other. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in him, or grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. No, it doesn't say, speak your truth. No, it doesn't say, speak truth to power. It says, speak the truth in love. Grow up. Church, what would happen if every member in the family of God put this into practice today? What if every person of Central Christian Church were to speak the truth in love? Simple. There would be people speaking the truth to one another, saying what needed to be said in the right way. Some of it would be like apples of gold and pitchers of silver. Some of it would be a bit difficult to listen to, kind of like, you know, in a movie when someone says, slap me, and the other person does. Some of it would mend relationships that need to be mended. But I think all of it would be a reflection of the way that Jesus cared enough to say what needed to be said. Speak the truth. Now, that probably doesn't mean that after the last prayer today, you jump up and you hunt down someone who needs a good rebuking. <clears throat> truth is what we need to speak to each other, all right? But there is also the way that we do that. We need to speak truth for each other. I've heard people say on occasions, oh, I just really needed to vent. So I did. I just unloaded it. And boy, do I feel better. Okay. How are the people around you doing? What do you mean when you start a conversation with the words, I need to say this? What's that mean? Sometimes it's good to be reminded that whenever you speak, your words aren't for you. Let me repeat that. Whenever you speak, your words aren't for you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for what? Building up, edifying the word means to build, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Grace those who hear, it says. In other words, the words you speak are for the people around you. They are not for you, not for you to feel better or prove yourself or win an argument, but to edify the people who hear you, to be a gift to them. In Colossians, Paul calls it this way, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And here you thought salty language meant something else. Nope, it's language that meets the need of the people who are hearing. Speak the truth, and when you do, speak for each other to build each other up. That kind of tempers this speaking truth to one another, doesn't it? All right, here's another part of this then. As you do this, receive truth from each other. Part of what will help this to happen among us like it should is when all of us make sure to be, like James said to do, be quick to hear. Your wisdom, your character is partly demonstrated by the way that you receive and accept words from other people. Someone cares enough to say what needs to be said. He or she comes to you with those words. What do you do with it? What do you say? Been there, done that. Sometimes it's not easy to take it in and to see if you can learn from it. But here's something that has helped me, I think, to do that better and I think can help us all. Words like these from Proverbs 9. 
Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Chapter 19, verse 25, strike a scoffer and the simple will learn prudence. Reprove a man of understanding and he will gain knowledge. David wrote in Psalm 141, let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Ecclesiastes 7.5, it is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. It's taken me some time in life, but I have learned to value the faithful wounds of a godly friend. And that's the person who cared enough to say what needed to be said to me, whether that was a word of encouragement or someone speaking the truth to me to help me be wiser still. And I know that if that person truly cares about me, I need to listen well. Because following Jesus' example includes that we care enough to say what's needed. You know, there is something very big at stake here about saying what needs to be said. It's not just about my feelings or your feelings. There are people who need for us to care enough to say what needs to be said to help them get into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Central Christian Church, we are praying for a person like that. What's that person called? That's your, that's your one person. Every one of us should have a one person that we're praying for by name. One person that we are praying that the Lord will help us to be able to influence and bring them somehow closer to life in Jesus Christ so that they can live forever. And we're praying that God will help us to say what needs to be said when it needs to be said for the sake of where that person is going to spend forever. You are doing that, aren't you? I love the book of James. I love it clear to the end. And then when it gets to the end, I love that even more. Is there at the end of James, he says, My brothers, if any one of you wanders away from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever turns a wanderer away from his, or sinner away from his wandering, will save his soul from death. Cover over a multitude of sins. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That if we would say what needs to be said, if we would go after someone who has wandered off and bring them back, James says, we will save their soul from death. And cover a multitude of sins. So here's something that needs to be said this morning. If you haven't got a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, you need to change that today. I'm not saying that because I'm on a high horse looking down. I'm saying that because Jesus Christ did that for me. He did that for you, and his intention is that you would be in a right relationship with him. If we're going to be true to what Jesus called us to be, then we're going to have to repeatedly say it. What needs to be said, you need this with him. So if you're here this morning and haven't made that decision, we are praying today that that will be your choice that you make. If you're a person here today who has already made that choice and you're just looking at the words of Jesus and, and trying to get it right. God bless you. Keep at it. Let's learn from him today. Let's make decisions at this time that are going to honor him. Stand up with me. We're going to pray. We're going to uh, have a song today that concludes our worship time. And during this time, please listen to what God has said in his word. Please pay attention to the things that you have heard and consider what it is he wants for you to do about it. Let's pray.
Father, we do thank you for your word that doesn't change. And today, Lord, we acknowledge to you that following in the steps of Jesus, saying things that sometimes are hard to say isn't easy for us. We need your help in this. We need your word to be our authority. We need the heart of Christ to be the way that we go about speaking. And Father, we need to be able to put this into practice right here among us first. But we also want to be good at this for the sake of what needs to be said in our community, in the culture in which we're living. Father, we believe, like Jesus said, that, that those words are life, that they are the power of salvation for those who believe. So help us to be quick to speak that good news and careful to do it in the way that you have called us to. Right now, Lord, help us to reflect on this. Burn into our hearts what it is you want us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.